Welcome. In this particular talk, we're going to have a bit of a summary of uh, some of the aspects that we'll want to consider uh, when rendering and drawing a scene uh, within our game. It's very much uh, it's going to try to pull together some of the different aspects that have been touched upon in the previous lectures, but to present it as a hopefully as a coherent whole. Start off first of all with uh, some uh, general practical advice uh, in terms of loading and storing our images. We want to have a little look about, um, you know, conceptually how we are doing this. Any images that we load in, um, obviously enough, they're going to be actually be stored in the device's uh, RAM. Now we're using uh, tablets for this particular course. And depending on the tablet, okay, it's going to have a finite amount of RAM available. On some devices, there is actually a dedicated amount of video RAM. And that's RAM set aside for the GPU to use. Quite often it is on the same die as the, or close to the, the GPU, so it can be accessed particularly quickly. On other devices, there may just be one large store of RAM, and that's shared between the CPU and the GPU. But uh, irrespective of this, in any case, uh, we will have a load request uh, going out to the storage device uh, on, on our tablet to load in, for example, uh, an image or an image sheet. That will be pulled into memory and stored in memory. And any time that we have a draw request, then we will be copying uh, from memory um, sections of the uh, or the entirety of the bitmaps that we've loaded in, and they get to be pushed out then onto a special area in memory that gets to be displayed uh, in terms of actual the the, the bytes, the pixels uh, that are displayed on the, the screen. Now, images are actually fairly large; they consume quite a large amount of memory. When they're stored, they tend to be stored in a compressed format. Um, whenever they load it into memory, um, most often they're stored in an uncompressed format. That there is actually some um, slightly compressed formats you can have them stored in, in memory, and, and then some hardware acceleration in certain devices for reading them. But for things we're talking about here, in most cases, we will be storing uncompressed uh, images in our RAM. And if you did a sort of a quick calculation based on the screen size that you have, and, and quite a lot of tablets now have quite high resolution screens, that is quite expensive in, in terms of memory. So what we, um, out, almost out of necessity within a game, find ourselves having to do is to reuse the graphics that we've loaded in. And you can see from this image here that uh, there is actually a small pool of graphics that are reused uh, to build up the scene. And it could be from the collectibles to the actual columns, that it is the same image just drawn in different uh, locations. And this is where the notion then of an asset manager comes into it. And this goes beyond the asset manager, really an asset loader available in Android, to one where we have a special class that is responsible for loading in uh, and holding on to those assets. And our game objects can then request a reference to it. So they don't get their own copy. There's only one physical copy, so to speak, stored in memory. But uh, the asset manager can hand out as many references as it wants to that particular asset. And that enables then our, our game uh, objects to make use of it. More sophisticated uh, asset managers, they may be able to load things dynamically. They could load things by level and discarding things as we, we run low on it. So there's lots of opportunity of making it uh, a fairly complex or sophisticated process. Once we've got things uh, loaded into memory, the next uh, stage when we're getting down to thinking about rendering is how we actually draw these things out. So we'll have a look at that. A few things we need to be mindful of, and this one we've, we've talked about before. Um, if we are presenting a 2D scene, in some scenes we will want to give the perception of, of depth. That uh, we may have a number of game objects, and we want to have some background layers behind those objects, and, and to draw them in a way where th there is the appearance of depth as things move about. 
few things from this. It means that when we're drawing our scene, we will want to ask, okay, in which uh, order do we wish to draw these particular layers so that it looks uh, consistent and uh, correct. For the different types of layers, uh, sometimes those layers, they might be different, even though we are combining them together to provide one coherent render. So as an example, you might have your your layer within which the game notionally is played. If you like, this is the layer within which all of our game objects reside. That uh, could be much larger than the screen. It could contain a lot of objects. And we may want to display the ones that are visible within the screen at any point in time. Alongside that, we might have background layers. And uh, in this, we might be using, for example, an image ribbon, which is only slightly larger than the screen. And we want to display that in a, a sort of a tiled uh, or a ribbon-based sequence to give the appearance of a, of a, a moving background uh, on top or in front of which uh, we have our game objects. So there's two different layers there, but in both cases we're taking a same size slice from both of those layers. It corresponds to the viewport on the screen um, to make sure that we're displaying the screen contents correctly. It also means that um, whilst our game objects are within our game layer, Sometimes, if we're moving the viewport in that, we have to make sure we appropriately move the viewport in our other layers uh, too. Culling is also quite, or can be quite important. Um, we, previous example, we mentioned that our, our game area, the game world, could be much larger than we can see in the screen at any one point in time. And it's quite true, it's quite possible we could have a large area and we want to restrict what it is we draw to those uh, elements, those objects, those tiles that actually fall within the screen uh, and not to try to do a lot of additional work um, beyond that, uh, attempting to draw things that fall outside of the screen. So no point drawing these things, it's just wasted effort. And this is where the idea of culling comes in that we can um, select the regions of the world that are visible and then just draw those particular regions uh, to your screen. In doing this, there's lots of different ways that actually it can be done. If uh, our world is tile based, then it's uh, going to be a calculation to work out, okay, which tiles start uh, where the viewport starts and how far do, does it go across until it ends and only iterating over that particular segment. Beyond that, there's lots of other, um, now, scene graph is simply a way of storing or organizing these, and there's lots of different ways you can structure or organize your game objects so you can efficiently parse uh, through them. For maximizing uh, performance, the, the, there's, there's different um, components to this. I mean, we're using a, a GPU here. It's the thing that will be drawing out and doing the heavy lifting, in most cases, uh, for drawing our, our, our textures. GPUs, they're much, f they, for drawing graphics, they tend to be much faster than CPUs because they're set up to be designed to be able to exploit massive parallelism. So whilst you're, you might have a dual core, or a quad core, or a hex core CPU, on your GPU, it is likely to have potentially hundreds, if not thousands, of, of small processors that can each do a bit of drawing. And um, that's, that's where they get their speed from. Now, one of the things we want to avoid is if we're going to the GPU and we're asking it to draw something, there needs to be a little bit of configuration, a bit of setup where it gets ready before it can go out to each of the, the processors and tell it, okay, here's the particular bit that you are doing. And that's an overhead. And ideally, we want to minimize the amount of overhead that we have within the game so we can best exploit the parallelism on the GPU. Different ways we can, um, we can do this. Uh, and, and it's a broad principle. We maximize the performance where if we're drawing a particular image, uh, and maybe drawing it multiple times, we draw that image all in one big batch. So that will enable the GPU to sort of get itself set up for drawing that image and then to go to the different processors and to request each of them draw different segments and it's then easy to iterate over to another request. Where you get per performance is where you 
ask the, the GPU to draw one image and then to draw another image, a different image, and then go back to the first image and draw a separate one after that. In that case, a lot of time is spent setting up, preparing uh, for the draw request, and, and, and less time is actually spent doing the draw. And that, that generally doesn't give you good performance uh, within your GPU. A little, little tip, uh, way of getting around that is that um, if you do have multiple images, say animations, you can store them in the same uh, sprite sheet. Uh, and that's a way of getting several images then, all notionally part of the same bitmap. You're just drawing different sections from it. So as a, as a bit of um, uh, I suppose a summary in this here, one of the key things you want to do is to have a clear vision of how you want your game to look. That's most important, to be able to see in your mind's eye how you want your game uh, to look like. You can then decompose that particular vision into different layers. You can think about how can I build up and draw that particular um, whatever it is you have in your mind. Once you've done that, you're then thinking about, okay, well, I've got several different layers. How can I draw each of those layers? And then finally, you're, you're splitting the problem up. You're devolving it down to the stage where you can eventually then draw a particular layer. So we have a summary of the steps, and, and these are, are things that most of the games that you're developing, you will want to have these steps uh, in, in your particular program. So again, it's an opportunity to take something which is large and complex, drawing a game, and chopping it up into a number of more manageable elements, so you can then focus on each of those elements and, and tackle that big problem by solving a number of smaller problems. So these are the steps here. So in your game, you're considering a number of, of they are separate, but they're dependent, so one links on to the other. So the first thing is you will want to have a uh, region within your game where you're loading in the assets, uh, the graphical assets that you will need, uh, your game objects will need. A few questions there is you always have to identify, well, what are those assets? Um, you also want to think about, well, what order do you need to load them in? Am I loading them in all at once at startup, or am I loading them in whenever we go into a particular level? Second question then is how are those assets going to be managed? So this is the asset manager you're going to use. What capabilities uh, will it possess? Once your assets have been loaded into your asset manager, then you're going to be creating the game objects. Those game objects, um, they will want to make use of the assets. For each game object, you will want to decide then, okay, well, which assets does this object need to get access to? And how is it going to do that? So you're, you're wanting to make sure that your game objects have a, have a way of accessing the asset manager to be able to retrieve and to, and to request the particular assets that they need to use. Once uh, we have this in, so this is, is very much the construction phase. After that, we'll go into the draw phase, where we'll be wanting to draw out our world. As soon as here, we have a number of layers, and inside each layer, we have a number of game objects. So one of the, the first questions is, if you have several layers, um, and you, may, you may have one, you may have several, which order should we be drawing these particular layers out to the screen? So you need to decide that. Then when you're drawing each of the layers, you're asking, okay, well, what objects do we have within that particular layer? And which of them are visible? Um, if it has a viewport, then you are deciding which objects in that viewport appear on the screen. That will give you a list of visible objects. And from that, you can then determine, right, well, what is the correct order in which for me to draw those objects? And, and depth sorting may come into it at this particular point. After that, you've effectively done all the hard work. You're then going to each of the objects and you're asking, OK, well, how do we draw you? And letting each object maybe draw itself uh, to the screen. And, and it's a series of steps that, will, that will, will take us through that particular process and, and break down what can be a complex process into a number of smaller, uh, more manageable steps. So by way of, uh, by way of takeaways on, on this, first most important thing, and this, this really is, is utterly essential. If you don't have this, it's going to be hard to, to do your game. Have a clear vision in your own mind's eye of how you want the game to look. That is 
utterly, utterly fundamental. Given that vision, you ideally want to, to be able to model the game then as a number of different layers, and those layers um, containing a number of different uh, game objects. And then within each of those layers, you're selecting uh, the objects that are visible, determining the order in which they are drawing, drawn, and then finally drawing them out to the screen. And, and that, that, in essence, that, that is it. That's all that needs to be done. So by following this particular process, you should be able to take what is a complex uh, set of series and break it up into something considerably more manageable.